So today we're doing philosophy of science and disproving evolution. Okay. Um, as you have questions, you know, please do. We have a discussion with this. All right. So you have learned this, right? Okay. So part of the way people educate now is like you say, okay, here's a thought you have. I will now break it. You know, it's like boot camp. I'll break you down, and you get a new thought. Okay, and it makes you start thinking. And so we're going to do that here. So here's your thought. Okay. So for example, hypothesis. You know, swans are all swans are white. That is awesome. Doesn't even present Berkeley. Who gives you enough evolution? Lecture in gorilla costume. You're my class, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly. All right, what did you ask me? You're in my class, right? I can yes. tell you. <laughs> okay. Stop, move this hard. <laughs> okay, so here's your hypothesis. How can you prove this? Observe all the swans. Right. So until then, you can observe a lot of swans, right? And you find all this evidence. Right? That, you know, here's our distribution of color, and we find all of them here. Right? So our process is supported, but then, and that's what happened when people, so this is an example that people thought all swans are white and then went to Australia and, oh, there are black swans there. You know? It's and, not a swan. Swan? I'm just saying that yeah. <laughs> the people who say it's all white would then argue it's not a swan. That'd be a way to deal with it, yeah. Um, but now the hypothesis is rejected, right? And that's why we thought of how science works. So you do a lot of experiments, keep finding hypothesis, and then all of a sudden you get one kind of example, rejected, move on, right? Okay. So, I'm going to expose to this, you know, so for example, <laughs> you make observations, right? Observations, things fall down. You make hypothesis, things will fall down. You do experiments, you drop things. And then from that you get a theory, gravity, right? That's how you're taught, like how science works, right? And so let's actually do that. So, you know, here I have, <coughs> you know, I'm running an experiment. You know, lemmings falling down, right? Um, and actually, so this idea that lemmings got so high, you know, huge population sizes and sort of spread and then went over cliffs and you know, died in the ocean. But actually, this is. What? They're real. Lemmings are real. Uh, so, are we watching like a hundred small fairy creatures jump to their death right here? No, you're watching Walt Disney fling them to their death. Yeah, so the thing is, this is coming from a Disney documentary, but they actually rigged it up so they had like a turntable to spin them off or they had people throwing them off. Um, what the hell? <laughs> Disney? This is why I don't want to do it Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but it's still a good experiment for gravity, right? What happens when you fling them off a cliff? They fall down. Yeah. They'd, I mean, they'd actually they'd then use them for other shots. They didn't kill them until later, probably. But yeah, they'd move them and have them. Yeah, and have them like, and then have a video of them swimming off into the sea. And, yeah. So it's, movies aren't real. Uh, <laughs> Oops. Right? So now I've rejected this. 
right? So scientific method says the, the theory of gravity has been rejected, right? So you know what's happening? So I do that all swans are white, the theory that mass attracts mass. Try to get a prediction, get a result, come to the prediction, theory's gone, get a result, come to the prediction, is theory gone? No. You still believe in gravity. There's evidence against it. change the rules. I mean, you did an experiment, you got a wrong result, you can't just explain it away, right? Or can you? And so, you know, so what, what's going on here? Helium sliders in the air, so it cracks the gravity. Right, you have this idea of buoyancy, right? The air is falling into these places and pushes it away. Yep. Good. So Yeah, and the helium will go off into space, and we're actually we have a helium. Uh, we have we're actually you know, the U.S. is actually running out of helium right now, just because so, you know because we get helium out of the ground, it goes off into space, and you yeah. You know. What? Anyway, that, that's separate issue. Our federal government stops stockpiling. You know, leaving federal policy alone, but yeah, helium is out of space. Right. But the basic the big overview here though is that you know. We have a theory. We, we have an experiment that tests it. Who's reject it? People don't. So people then modify their ideas. So here's the obligatory Darwin quote. Now, I want to talk, split in groups and talk about do you agree with this or not? Speak. All right, so let's talk. So what do people think? I hear this disagreement, which is, which is awesome. I don't agree with it because I feel like if you only observe according to what you're theorizing, then you could start to bias what you're observing. Okay. I mean, it's perfectly reasonable to just 
just count things and mention their color and like log them away and then like 50 years from now they're like man i'm really glad that they just observed this because now i can use it for my theory whereas if they're just like pebbles come from space and i'm gonna observe things to that effect all right, what do, people, what do people think about that? We have science that just absorbs observing stuff, just to observe stuff. We want to know what it means. Yeah, because it's like, that's really depressing. I mean, you gotta have, like, motivation to do something. Seriously, you're going through that. Okay, but, but, but yeah, okay. I think it's a balance of you're making the whole. You have observations that you're going to make, but sometimes you don't know what to observe. So when you start theorizing and then start forming more questions, you then know what you might know better what to observe. So it kind of goes both ways. What do people think? What else people think? I think it's important that the direction of the question, you don't just can't go blind to what it's going to be. I think you should definitely have some sort of reason for collecting the data. I think observation is important for certain things like chance, tasks, like a lot of the aspects of quantum theory. I have a cat in the box at home. Do you? Yeah. Actually, is dead? I don't know. It's sort of. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that observation is important, but I think the vast majority of science, especially in a field like this, where you can test things, I think it's good to have a reason to at least to direct your data so you know what you're looking at. You might see a trend better if you're looking for it. But over the years, it then biases what you see. Be accurate. What was the idea that you know science is boring if it's just observation? But unless you like really like counting and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in my experience, I mean, there are a lot of scientists who just you know really dig ants. They just really want to look at ants. And it's just ant watching videos. It's like the sun. I mean, if you're not if you're not trying to find anything out, then you're just observing. Well, how would you define science? Um, um, using observation to enhance your understanding. So not just. So it is. Without like, you know, you have to have like a purpose. Yeah. So a movie critic observes things and builds a theory about like. Yeah. <laughs> but is it science? No. no. What what makes that not science? You make a theory about like horror films, right? Personal opinion. Because I was thinking that punctual equilibrium is true, of course, right? It's all based on looking at stuff. you always have something concrete that you can measure or demonstrate that you have the evidence in order to sign it. It's a good proof of policy. But you can't say, well, you know, he meant that this character was supposed to be a Christ figure by the end of the game. Like someone says, you know, you're wrong. Like, you know, I guess the movie comes out and says it. And, you know, it's just, oh, that's just
that's just all subjective and abstract science. Science isn't subjective and abstract. 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 Science isn't subj
about something that was like a man of strong conviction. Right? Understand that the channel is man of strong conviction. Pain was suffered. I mean, what would Darwin think about it? I'm mean, based on that quote. Well, they've done the odds observing, but they're also citing a potential for this. Yeah, because they went into the description. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not necessarily a theory. It's like, it'd be good if we knew this. So I'm saying, be, but for utility, not for. You know, understand the world. Like saying, like, you know, so and so's theory of venom is wrong and such and such theory of venom is right. Yeah. Well, the reality is you still have to, if you want to do the science, you have to have something that will pay for it and the reason that the science would a lot of times be utility is what pays the way for science. So that adds a whole other Yeah, I mean, there's a the whole sides as a business thing, which is an issue too, right? But we might have time to talk about it in a later class. But just like thinking about like, you know, and also like it comes into play like you think about like, okay, you do research, you want to get published in Nature, so that way you'll get tenure. You know, how do you package this fact in order to get it, get it, you know, in a high journal? And that's something that people say science think about a lot. That's sort of more of the business of science than science. Sometimes wish I was that young, had my estate, my money, and could just be the natural philosopher and fiddle around with stuff. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, Darwin was unusual. I mean, like Wallace was, you know, also figuring out natural selection, but he was, you know, working through the jungles, getting collections for stuff for people, sending it back to England, having the boat sink with everything, you know, and keep going, working. You know, so he was living sort of hand to mouth. So, and science was a leisure activity, but there was also this like, you know, collector activity that was being paid for, but that was still a lot harder. Yeah. So, I mean, empirically in modern science, there's a mixture of observation just for observation's sake and observation to address theory. Right, um, even the observation for observation's sake is often packaged as testing a theory. Right, because it's more interesting to have a narrative about, you know, oh, we found out something new about the world because you know that guy was wrong. Here's a new idea. Right? There's a mixture in modern science. <coughs> but if the only wrong way to do it is to start with a conclusion and work backwards, like I, I could see that being the only thing. Really matter if you start with observation or theory, as long as you don't start out with some preconceived notion of what's going to happen and then you work to prove that. Well, what about Gould and Eldridge? Like they say, okay, everyone thinks this is gradualism. We think this is a punctuated process. Let's write a paper about it and provide examples. Is that not science? Did they start out with that notion? Fine. Did they not have that information beforehand? Read something somewhere and it's like, oh, that seems like how that works. Let's test it. And then that seems like how that works. I mean, they had the idea based on some data. They got the other data too. What? Thermal seismic sensors. How about not watching? <laughs> I know, right? I can see that everybody watching. I mean, Darwin didn't start out with evolution and how was it with life? No. Observe I mean, he was, he was going around the world, he didn't believe in evolution at all, right? And he gradually got that idea. But once he had that idea, he spent the next 20 years getting evidence for it. Is that not science? It then? is science, that's what I'm saying. But, like, if I was alive before gravity was widely studied, and I said, why do things fall to the ground? Because there's a giant hamster spinning around the wheel under the earth that causes suction. Uh -huh. That's not science. Why isn't that? Because that's ridiculous. But on your way, you might discover that it's actually a kind of empirical sense of thing that's about the conclusion of gravity. And that way you're saying, well, I think there's science in there. Even if you just 
I mean, that happens a lot. I mean, continental drift. Like, look, the continental, you can put them together like a jigsaw puzzle. So I bet it happened. You know? And let me go and find, you know, some evidence. Oh, look, I see this fern species on, you know, South America and Africa. How to get there? Right? And then, oh, I see this other fossil on North America and Europe. But okay, how to get there? By saying, oh, look, that's an observation. I observed that the continents fit together like that. I find data to test this, and I come up with the theory of the continental drift. Right. So Baker theorized that the continents plowed through the ocean floor as their location. Where's the track left by South America and the North Atlantic from Africa? He thought that they were actually forcing their way through. That part of his theory is laughable. Yeah. <laughs> and I have that on our playlist in the car. Listen to that the other day. Listen to it. Yeah, but I'm glad I taught you something. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, what about, so, so let's talk more about this idea of the, I mean, so you, so it's not science if you have an idea and then work to work to prove it. Does that mean that? I'm not. I think that that's an implication. It might not be a science implication. Okay. What, what do people think about that? Isn't that testing a hypothesis though? No. Yeah, that's what testing a hypothesis is. But when you test a hypothesis, I guess it just depends on what you want to talk. I mean, I, I feel like if you start with a conclusion, your observation and everything will be inherently biased. Because you aren't working to understand something objectively. You are working to prove your point or something. But the, the implication is that if there's a pattern that causes the point, you also, if you observe a pattern, that your observation of a pattern, you then try to hypothesize what the process is making that pattern. And then that sort of, you know, Alfred Wagner saw a pattern. He hypothesized a process, got part of it right, and the rest he didn't. But new information came about, and 30, 40 years later, it was like, this was right. What if I say that berries exist and I can prove this by taking pictures of small broken twigs and woods that were under the trees and under the berries, and put them in the field and left by berries? And then I hypothesize that these tracks lead to the evidence that there are berries, even though we can't see, the human eye can't see berries, but there's evidence, concrete evidence, that berries exist. Publish that. Let's see what happens. <laughs> so I think there was a <laughs> group of people who were not that. trying to prove that. Thompson published that. Yeah, yeah. Discover something yeah. awesome about yeah. berries. Yeah. That's one view of theory, like this falsificationist view. Like, you know, the whole purpose of science is to reject hypotheses. There's another view <laughs> that what it is is you have these theories that you're trying to provide evidence for, and then you know, the competing theory arises, and you start deciding which theory better fits the data, and modifying them. Yeah, I've just decided that if I'm a doctor in any way, I'm going to publish things like that every once in a while just to get the just to throw a wrench in the gears. Who knows? We should talk about peer review at some point too. Uh, I know, but everyone reading it. That, that's that's a good life goal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, so I think you're you know publishing the idea that you know theories are breaking twigs in the forest, and here's evidence for it. I mean, that's science, right? What what where you get in trouble is if you you know if you're breaking twigs yourself, you know, and then saying that the fairies did it, that's that's fraud, right? Or you have your, you know, your Barbie doll making little tracks, little track weight or something, right? I mean, that's not science. But, you know, if you have a theory, you have evidence for a theory and publish it, that's all good. Right? You can also say, well, actually, you know, twig breakage rates are consistent with a random process instead. Well, and there's a specific species of mole in that area. And it's more parsimonious than this idea of, you know, 
magical fairies. And so you know, a simpler idea is probably the moles or the random breaking. So that's, si that's science. That's fine. Yeah. Any discussion about this? Can we get into the religion versus science today? No. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there are classes here that are about like evolution and religion, and this class is about like evolution society. Get into that, but yeah, we're just just doing science. Yeah. So, what we do with science in general is we go from Theory, hypothesis, prediction, observation. And the observation bears back on the theory, right? <clears throat> That's go all the way up through this chain too, right? So, you know, when I observe balloons going up, it doesn't mean up oh, there goes gravity. It means that oh, the hypothesis needs to be modified, right? That you know things should things should fall in a vacuum. If they're in a in the, fluid or gas, maybe not. Right, so you don't blow, 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 you don't blow up the theory, you modify the stuff around the theory. <coughs> right, so here's my theory, and here's my hypotheses, here's my, you know, or my, my auxiliary hypotheses, my predictions, and my observations. Right, and so they might agree mostly, so agree means agreement. They can have a competing theory. That might be simpler, right? And can explain all of this pretty well, right? And so eventually, people might start believing in this theory instead. And actually, people look, looked a lot at how that happens. So something could happen is everyone say, "Up, oh, we were wrong. Yep, this is right." Okay, and that's what ha that happens sometimes when there's like spectacular evidence. So like you know, special relativity. Right, so Newtonian physics versus special relativity, you go and you look and see, oh, yep, we see this deflection of mercury from where it should be. Yep, must be um, special relativity. Okay, there's no way it could happen under general relativity. So sometimes you have things like that. But a lot of stuff is statistical. Yeah? You missed that question on the test today because I forgot to ask this one. You were trying to ask if the constraints are actually put to prove logic. Why does that prove special relativity? Oh, um... All right, we are here. Here's the sun. Here's Mercury. Right. So under Newtonian um, physics, what should happen is it has to move. This, might move in a straight line. Right. So Mercury is here. You can't see it. Mercury is here. You can just see it. Right. In special relativity, what happens is light is bent. And so even Mercury is back here, you can still see it from this gravitational lens. I thought for some reason it had to do with just the orbit, and that's why I see how this could possibly be <coughs> And actually, this sort of thing, I mean, special relativity doesn't really help much in biology, but like quantum mechanics does. And so, like, the way that plants use photosynthesis actually is based on quantum tunneling of photons, which I think is cool. Or oh, of electrons, I think. <coughs> yeah. But quantum effects, which is kind of cool. She's the idea from Asimov about how we get closer and closer to the truth. Right? And people thought there was a flat, they were wrong. But there was a sphere, they were wrong. All right? But this is less wrong. Asimov had a couple of books about robots. Yeah. He was yeah. also very big in the philosophy of science. He was about to make talk about some yeah, and he also wrote like you know popular books about astronomy for people. But yeah, he's was, he was mostly known as a science fiction writer. Yeah. Doesn't mean he's wrong. Yeah. So, for example, you know, here's a view of the world. Right, Iron Eagle. That's wrong. The next view, you know, better. And now it's actually something like this, where it's not quite a not quite a perfect sphere. Right, the Earth actually bulges at the middle a little bit. Okay. And so, you know, we assume purple's the truth. You know, the red one's a lot closer than the green one. Right? And this tells us how science works. Okay. 
So, challenging evolution. So, one of the people who's worried about is there's this conspiracy to like protect idea evolution, right? And so, if it's anti-evolution, people will not, not allowed to be published or that sort of thing, right? Same thing with climate change. People are worried about you know scientists having this big scam about climate change, um, <coughs> but it actually doesn't work very well. So, for the way science works is you keep trying to break or falsify ideas. Right, in your view, right? So, you know, if I could publish a paper showing that evolution doesn't work in some aspect, I mean, that's really interesting. People, people like that sort of thing. Okay. Um, people don't make discoveries about the world. So, if you can show that you know our current our current view is wrong, this new view explains the world better. That's why people are that's why people are in the business. They care about that sort of thing. Right. There's also this view in science that it's important to be skeptical. And finally, if you think people are just, you know, acting on base impulses, there's this impulse for fame and fortune, right? So that's the end of the day. If I want to get more get more money for my job, you know, I can get I get raises periodically, right? But when you can get a big a big pay jump is to get a competing offer from someone else, and they'll say, okay, come to Harvard, we'll pay you twice as much, and they can say to Tennessee, I'll stay here, you pay me three times as much, right? And sometimes they'll say, sure, we will, right? Um, and it's one way of jumping in salary. And so if I could make you know, a big discovery about evolution to get me hired somewhere, somewhere else, then you can turn that into actually more money in your pocket. Right? And so even if there were a conspiracy, you know, my wife and kids aren't going to let me like, support this conspiracy and not be able to pay you know, for a bigger house. Right? So you know, there's, this competing, there's always pressure to you know, break. If there were a conspiracy, there's always be pressure to break it right? for various, you know, for noble reasons and for base reasons. Right. But then, how would you test evolution? Right. Well, we can go back to predictions. Right. So we predict those transitional forms, right, based on evolution, and then you can go and look and find them. Right. <coughs> so you know all these theropod bird transitional forms. Right. Or whales. Right. Their yeah, whales with feet. Hind limbs. Right. Even now, whales have little hip bones. Okay. You can also predict things like similarity. Right. So, you know, here we find, here we have a squid gene being expressed on a fruit fly wing, and the squid gene is for making eyes. And what happens is you make fruit fly eyes on the wing. Right. So if evolution weren't true. You know that'd be remarkable coincidence, right? But what this does, if evolution is true, this this you ex you might expect this if you think that there's this deep homology with these genes. Now, if this didn't happen, would it disprove evolution? No, right? It could have the genes could have evolved enough, or it could have evolved twice. Right? But this is consistent uh, consistent with predictions from evolution. Okay. Here's another paper from a couple years ago, also in Nature. And they had predictions about, you know, did life evolve once or more than once? Because, you know, bacteria are very different from eukaryotes, from archaea. So it could be that they evolved, you know, just separately. Right? And what they did here was develop models and test which model is better. A model that has one origin of life, a model that has multiple origins of life. Which model predicts the data better? Right? Just like we can do coin flipping models, right? Which model predicts the coin flips better? And they found that you know the single origin of life model worked better. Okay. <coughs> and so these are sort of some of the ways you could test it. Right? And if they had found this, you know, first thing you would do is say, okay, this is a rather extraordinary claim. Right? As Carl Sagan says, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? So you first would go back and say, you know, is this wrong in some way? And then later you actually figure out, yep, this is true. So for example, there was recently a case of People finding um, things of light, light, light of some sort of signal coming coming from Italy to Switzerland faster than the speed of light. I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And so they had a little press release, and there's all this buzz about it. And people said, well, you know, let's check this out further. Found out one of their clocks was set incorrectly because they were timing it wrong. Right. Um, <coughs> but you know, it, it, it would have been an amazing result. But you know, you have to go back and check it. Or you know, form these auxiliary hypotheses about you know, 
measurement error or something like that. Uh, but in this case, sometimes we do finally find, you know, yeah, they were wrong, and you know, continents do actually move. Sort of thing. Okay. So that's sort of philosophy of science and you know how you test evolution and why you'd want to. Any questions about any of this? Any views people want to express that you had a chance to? Okay. And we should see, I mean, science is messy, right? There's all these things going on, but you know, eventually it works out. It's a pretty effective way of, at approximating the truth better and better through time. All right, good. I'll see you on Friday. And really start thinking about what you want to cover in like the you know free topic lectures.